Kevin Drennan, former chief of staff for uh, state senator, former state senator Steve Sweeney, uh, one of the most powerful state senators in uh, New Jersey history. Awesome guy. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Hey, definitely. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Introduce yourself. Uh, give us a little background and where you went to high school. And <laughs> Sure. Born and raised uh, in New Jersey. Spent almost all my days in New Jersey. Uh, Northwest Jersey. Went to Warren Hills High School. Uh, it was a great uh, rural, bucolic area in the mountains towards the Delaware Water Gap. Uh, went to the College of New Jersey after uh, about two years at the College of New Jersey. Got in right into politics. Was a campaign manager uh, for a state house candidate in Center City, Orlando. Uh, after a little while there, I came back up and worked uh, for United States Senate candidate John Corzine at the time. Uh, and stayed in New Jersey politics ever since. How did you like Florida? Uh, I hated it. Uh, <laughs> I really thought I would love it. I originally I'd wanted to go to college there. Uh, it was it's boring. It just doesn't have the culture and uh, the wonderful diversity that New Jersey has. So right. it, was, it was not anything I expected it to be. So when you got to New Jersey, give us a little bit about how you got started in the politics. Sure. I, I worked as the uh, field director for the third congressional district in 2000. So that included uh, Susan Bass Levin, who was running for Congress, uh, U.S. Senator Corzine, or candidate Corzine, uh, at the time. And then, of course, Al Gore was on the presidential ballot, as well as other Democratic candidates. Um, and it was right after a very contentious primary between former Governor Florio and uh, John Corzine, of course. And there was some division in the South, having not uh, worked uh, uh, on the primary here because I was in Florida I didn't know anything, didn't know anybody, and sort of was a neutral party. Just jumped right into it to help, uh, you know, recruit people to uh, get the vote out, uh, which was a lot different in 2000 than it is in 2023. Right, right. You feel like you got a lot of experience doing that, or how did you... Uh... Yeah, it was a lot of baptism by fire. I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, I was given a, a box, uh, a, you know, which would have been a paper box uh, with a post-it note. Uh, that had an address on it, and right. I was told to show up there. And this was, you know, I, before MapQuest, really, even before GPS, before anything. So I ran down to Cherry Hill and got myself lost a little bit, eventually <laughs> found the office and, and went from there. But didn't have a computer, uh, had a cell phone, which wasn't a smartphone. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and just dove in. And basically it was, you you need to contact this many people, get this many people to vote. Uh, and nobody told me exactly how to do it, but we just, we looked, baptism by fire at the time. Uh, how was the pay? Like what kind of pay would you get? Uh, I was making, I think, $1,200 a month. Okay, which uh, is not a lot. <laughs> no, especially when you're working about 24 hours a day. Right. Uh, but yeah, I was not, I was not making a lot of money, uh, but got a lot of experience and, uh, you know, I'm glad it happened. Uh, I, I'm also glad that's not how we treat our workers anymore, but right. <laughs> it was a good learning opportunity back then. So how did you get involved with uh, Senator Steve Sweeney? So uh, in 2001, I had worked on uh, also the coordinated campaign for Governor McGreevy, and I, my territory was largely the first legislative district, uh, which overlapped in Cumberland County with the third legislative district of which Steve Sweeney was uh county freeholder at the time and running uh, for state Senate. And then just by the nature of how things evolved, I ultimately was running all of Cumberland County. Uh, so I interacted with, uh, at that time, Steve Sweeney, Doug Fisher, and John Bersicelli on their campaigns and helping uh, do the field operation for them. And then uh, went into Governor McGreevy's office. And of course, they had won their election, John, Doug, and Steve, and just always maintained a relationship with them from that point forward uh, until working for Steve Sweeney in 2012 is when I started. Um, how was Senator Steve Sweeney? Like, give us a little bit about his character. How was he, you know, to work with? He, he is an intense individual, uh, but very, very loyal. Um, always had my back. I always had his back. Um, I don't think I know, I've been in government now for about a quarter of a century. I don't think I know anybody that I've come across who knows more about how government works, should work, can work than Steve Sweeney. He's just, uh, and given his labor background, nobody can negotiate uh, like Steve Sweeney. So when he wanted to get something done, uh, he was going to get it done. And it, it wasn't his way or the highway. Uh, although I believe some people had that perception. He was really good at understanding that he had to negotiate and negotiations to get to the end uh, require compromise. 
uh, and we were good at it. He never gave up on what he wanted, but always found, hey, what do I want? How do I get what do I want? And how can I give somebody what they want? Um, and he, you know, he was absolutely great to work with. And uh, I couldn't have, I couldn't have asked uh, for anyone better. And um, really enjoyed uh, the ten years. I had only planned to be with him for a year, uh, and ended up being with him for ten. Okay. So when you for uh, so you, you were responsible for him getting elected to the senator seat. So I, I partially, I mean, I wasn't okay. the main person, but yeah, I had a, I, again, a, the part of his district in Cumberland County, I became responsible for towards the end of the campaign in 2001, but there was a lot more people <laughs> involved than me. Uh, and he was, because of having the labor backing and very strong labor backing, a lot of funding that year. Um, and, you know, we're, we, he was able to flip that district to, you know, it was a Republican district to a, to a Democratic district. Um, and in the first district where I was, that was the year Jeff Andrew, when he was a Democrat, uh, was elected. And it was the first uh, Democrat in the legisl first legislative district, I think, since the Civil War or something like that. Well, take us back to 2001. How, how mm -hmm. was the feeling when you when he got elected and what was kind of like behind the scenes of the election process? Yeah, um, like, I mean, well, any election, I mean, it was a, it was a much different year in 2001. Uh, from the previous years because it was a legislative redistricting year, which meant we got a new uh, district map. And in addition to that, uh, Jim McGreevy was our uh, candidate for governor and the Republicans had Brett Schindler. And all the momentum was just for the Democrats. So, you know, there was a lot of fundraising that had to get done. There was a lot of groundwork that had to get done. But there were, the, the, the map definitely was... Uh, more beneficial to the Democratic Party than the previous maps. Um, and our gubernatorial candidate was so far superior, both in, uh, you know, the quality, at least from the voter perspective, right, from the quality of the candidate, which put him very far ahead in the polls, uh, as well as with fundraising. And the big reason the map was better was the Democrats had won a victory of what they called, um, uh, I forget exactly what the terminology was, but there used to be packing. And the idea of packing from the Republican side was, oh, you know, minorities need to have an opportunity to be represented. That's in, it was in this, the Voting Rights Act uh, in the federal government. Well, that's all true. But if you do it in such a way that it then um, is detrimental, both to the expansion of uh, minority candidates as well as to any one party, then it's being done for the wrong purpose. So the Republicans had packed a lot of our urban areas with minority voters where they didn't have the same impact as if they were unpacked. And so by unpacking, uh, which was a fair process, uh, there was a better representation of communities. Uh, we actually increased the amount of members who were minority uh, members, including ultimately in the third uh, legislative district when Adam Talaferro was elected. Um, but going back to your question, the, um, uh, you know, there was a huge movement for labor, right? When, sure. when Steve Sweeney got elected, given his iron worker background, his building trades background, and um, there was a front page article, Labor Man, Labor's Man in Trenton, mm -hmm. uh, which was true and, and which was great, um, I think, for the working class here in New Jersey. We did a, a PLA was one of the, um, uh, uh, no, sorry, prevailing wage was one of the first bills that the Governor McGreevy signed into law. Uh, and really improved working conditions for members of the building trades. Got it. All right. So, I mean, and he wasn't contested until, what, 2020, 2021? Yeah, well, the 2001 race was very contested when right. he was on seating uh, an incumbent state senator who actually had flipped parties for that election, but had a long-term uh, Senator Ray Zane. Um, but no, from that point on, um, there there wasn't, much of competition for him. Uh, I think it's more of a reflection of who he was, uh, a moderate, uh, very representative of the third legislative district. But in 2017, the New Jersey Education Association spent about $5 million trying to unseat the center president, going back over some uh, pension and health benefit reforms that he was involved with. So while there was no major candidate there, there was, a, you know, certainly a significant effort. That race in 2017 was the most, is still, it's the most expensive rate, legislative race in the history of the country. Well, okay, and wow. so while, you know, and again, you know, so the expectation, the difference between 2017, 2021, um, Ed Durr spent, from what I understand, about ten, twenty thousand dollars 20000 versus $5 million spent 
against the Senate President Sweeney at that time in 2017. So um, certainly, I mean, we had, um, I, I forget all the candidates' names, but there was there was some other uh, quality candidates. But I think the Senate President had such a dynamic personality, such a good record, such an understanding of the district that the voters kept reelecting him. The 2021 outcome had a lot more to do with there was 12,000 voters who didn't vote in any state Senate, state legislative or gubernatorial elections. They were federal electioneer voters who, because of the dynamics of vaccine mandates, school closings, um, just a bit of the polarization of the country that came out to vote. And that the Senate President Steve Sweeney only lost by 2,000 votes, but it really was a reflection of these 12,000 voters. We just could not have expected uh, to come out to vote. Okay, so for those who don't know New Jersey politics, let's go back to 2017. So mm-hmm. he was contested by... I don't even remember the candidate's name. But okay. it was the NJA spent $5 million supporting an effort to beat Steve Sweeney. Okay, and Steve Sweeney won in 2017. That's correct. And he spent about $8 million, so it was about a $13 million race. So it's, it takes a lot of money to go to these races. Well, yeah, but then if you go to 2021, Ed Durr raised about and spent about 20000 Steve Sweeney spent about a million, right? Million. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and we got the same, the center, Steve Sweeney got the same amount of votes in 2021, roughly speaking, as he did in 2017. Okay. But so, the, the Republican turnout was just exceptionally more. So the whole campaign with Ed Durr was that he only spent like a thousand dollars. Yeah. So, it was a little more than that, but yeah, but it might as well have been a thousand. Okay. So take us back to that election. You were the chief of staff mm-hmm. for um, Senator Sweeney. Mm-hmm. What was the what was the campaign like, and how did you, you know, give us a little roadmap of how you developed that yeah. campaign? I mean, the campaign was like any other campaign, right? Um, you, you figure out what your target is, you figure out what your vocals are going to be, and it was very similar to what we were looking at in 2017, um, looking at who would come out for a state legislative election, who in 2017 was also a gubernatorial year, who would come out in a gubernatorial year. And we looked at our targets. Uh, we focused on our targets, right? That's who we would hit for mail. Um, you, you hit all the community events as you typically would do. We didn't do a lot of voter registration. We did polling. Our polling was very strong. It showed us up by almost 20%. Um, but we were polling on that electorate of which same electorate as we've seen in 2017, or we probably saw in 2019 or 2015, voters who would vote in a, a state election, not voters who would vote in a federal election. So you know, everything we did, I think is, you know, even with 2020 hindsight, yeah, would I do it differently? But at the time we were looking to hit our same vocal when, from the year we spent $8 million to hit that vocal. And it wasn't us. There's independent expenditures along with hard side expenditures. Um, but, you know, we, and we did that. We did exactly what we're going to do, but neither the polling nor, nor any of our experts. And, you know, I was only one of a team, uh, did we expect to see such a massive turnout? And we unf- we missed it. And many people missed it. How, how much confidence did you have in that election? Did you go in the elections thinking we're gonna we got this? I mean, we're going against a trucker. There's no way this guy's gonna win. Mm-hmm. We got this in the bag. Yeah, I mean, other than the um, opposition research we did, I, we didn't really spend much time thinking about the opposition. Right. right? It was not, we thought about the voters and the issues we wanted to talk to, but you'll see that there wasn't much negative uh, activity from the from our side against the Republicans, right? That's not what we were focused on. We were just focusing on our record, which was very strong, what we've done for the district, you know, the, the wind port, uh, saving the nuclear power plants, the expansion of Rowan University, um, you know, the, the building of Paulsboro Port, Rapano Port, just so much uh, economic activity the school funding, which benefited, especially we're sitting here in Swedesboro, one of the, the biggest beneficiaries of the school funding uh, activity that the center president put in, in place. So we had nothing but every reason to believe that, you know, the voters would continue to reelect us because we've been doing things that the voters wanted. Um, unfortunately, so we walked into election day, absolutely uh, feeling, hey, we're going to win this thing. I was starting to plan out what the, the next... Um, agenda would be for the for the Senate president and for the legislature going into um, uh, the most, uh, well, this term, they're still in it, this term, uh, and then about midway through the day. Are, yeah, okay, let's, so, let's, I don't want you to go too no, ahead okay. because I want to, yeah, yeah. I want the viewers to understand what went on. So let, let's, let's 
Sure. Talk 24 hours prior to the election winning. What were you guys doing? What was the scene uh, in the background? Yeah, you're getting, so we're getting ready. Um, down here, we do a major labor rally um, and they go door to door. So we start in the morning uh, of election day. Where, and, and this is actually election day when he was. Yeah, so that's what we were preparing for. So okay. that's what I'm saying. So yeah, so you're preparing for that. You know, we're getting uh, all of our packets finalized. A lot of that's already done, but your packets right. finalized for going door to door on election day, reminding people to vote, doing phone calls. And you're doing all that preparation. A lot of it, if you do it right, and I believe we did, we were largely ready. So that's what we were getting ready for. And, you know, and uh, make it, you know, confirming people who are going to be at the rally, the speakers, the 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 attendees, as, as well as the walkers, getting the vans where they need to go. We rent a lot of vans to move the canvases around right. uh, the district. But that's, we were doing the things you normally do. And okay. we felt good. Okay. And then so midway, you know, people are, Doing the election, voting. Give us the point or time when you started realizing, wow, this is mm -hmm. not going the way we want it to go. Sure. So through election day, if you you know, you're always following what's happening in each of the precincts. Right. And so early on, you're not really sure, right? People start voting and you get a sense. We had knew we did very well with the vote by mails. Um, but then all oh, about, I would say about three o'clock, I think is when it hit. I could be wrong, but roughly that amount of time in the afternoon, we started getting reports about the precincts and you track usually Democratic precincts, then you track swing districts as well as Republican districts. And what we were seeing is the Repo the districts that were he more heavily Republican were getting it to a turnout that we were not expecting. Right. Um, and it, it was at, uh, you know, just, and that's when we started saying, if, if that's their turnout and we were hitting our targets, mm -hmm. but their turnout was, you know, let's say we were at a hundred percent, they were at 200% roughly, right. Speaking in some of these districts. And it was just, that's when we were like, we're in trouble. Why do you think that year it was, it was like that? So remember this goes back. I mean, you're still in the midst of COVID uh, schools have been closed. People are unhappy. You had vaccine mandates, people are unhappy. And if you got to look, the third legislative district, while we had it represented by Democrats for 20 years, um, in 2016, Donald Trump won it. 2020, Donald Trump won it. Um, there's no other legislative district that was represented by a single Democrat, let alone all three Democrats, where Donald Trump won both times. There's Republican districts still to this day that were are represented by Republicans where Donald Trump didn't win both times. This district, if, if when you have these voters, uh, the federal election voters, they come out and this is how they vote. They, what, they were driven out. You had critical race theory, you know, issues on top of it. Um, and you just add the, those things up. And the in addition to that, Governor Murphy ran a fairly liberal and progressive campaign, which he can do. But he put a lot of that uh, message out in South Jersey where it doesn't resonate the same way it does in North Jersey. Um, yeah, I think you add it all up. It's not one thing, but you add it all up and people were motivated to vote and they were motivated to vote against Democrats. They, at that time, you know, Joe Biden was in the white house. They're blaming Joe Biden. They're blaming governor Murphy. People are unhappy and, um, you know, they have, they have a right to speak. Uh, and that they, you know, I, it'll be interesting to see if they return to vote this year. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling they're not, you're going to have a, it doesn't mean Democrats are definitely going to win, mm -hmm. but the turnout for the Republicans is going to be much lower in 2023 than it was in 2021. So, I mean, I'm sure it was devastating. What was Senator Sweeney's reaction? I mean, you had to have that initial phone call. Yeah. So I would, so we spoke, so on election night, votes were still coming in. Um, I stopped by the division of elections, which is where the center president was. It was so packed. I decided not to go inside. I went over to the, um, to the, where the quote unquote victory party would be. Right. And uh, I, I had a bite to eat. I called the Senate president and I said, listen, I don't know what's happening. You know, I'm going to head home. You know, let's talk later. Right. Uh, so, of course, I can't sleep, uh, not even trying to sleep, but watching the returns. And I forget what time at night, but it's pretty late. I remember getting a call and um, Senate president said, he called me up and said, I think we lost. Um, and I said, yeah. Uh, and that was pretty much the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Was he devastated? Was he? He definitely, yeah. I mean, okay. it, you know, it was unexpected. This is, you know, he had been a county freeholder for 10 years before becoming uh, a state senator. So he'd been elected office for 30 years. Um, you know, it, it was his passion, as people probably know, it was driven by uh, 
uh, he was driven to get into public service by his daughter, right. uh, you know, who was born with Down syndrome. Uh, and he had done so much, uh, you know, for the community, especially for that. And I think that hurt him as well. To, there aren't a lot of voices uh, for the developmentally disabled, and he was, he was the strongest, um, and, and it's now missing. So among, uh, amidst everything else that, that bothered him, I think there was still more left undone um, for, for the community, there, as there always will be. Um, and that voice is it was missing, like I said, among other things, but that, that probably was the most personal to him. Uh, for sure. And I spoke to several state uh, Republicans mm. who said, you know, regardless of, you know, we want to have a Republican in office, we love mm -hmm. Senator Sweeney. So you have Republicans who mm -hmm. really respect and love Senator Sweeney, even though they want a Republican in office, mm -hmm. they still have that respect for him. So that's that that speaks volumes yes. about his character <laughs> and mm -hmm. his position. Um, what are the, some of the things you learned from that? election like as far as losing the election i think you have to have a good pulse uh on, on your electorate and i think we were so focused on the the typical electorate that you know we failed to expand the our contact base that if we had um i don't think we could have changed the outcome mind you and i've said this center president because he's i was responsible for the turnout operation and identifying targets and um, and I just said to him, I was like, you know, we probably could have felt what was going to happen. I don't think we could have prevented it. There wasn't enough for us to drive out a, a higher Democratic performance in the district beyond where we got. And I don't know if anything we could have done could have tampened and maybe could have if we went more negative, but could have tampened down the individuals uh, who come, came out to vote against us that we weren't expecting. These aren't individuals who are following state politics. These are individuals, if, I bet you, if we I, it would probably narrow it down, but let's say we could identify specifically those 12,000 people. I don't think 12,000 people decided they were voting for Ed Durr and against Steve Sweeney. It wasn't a referendum on Steve Sweeney. It wasn't a, a hey, we love Ed Durr. It was, we don't like what's going on in the country right now. We don't right. like what how uh, uh, close government is to our daily lives. And it's the Democrats' fault, and we're blaming them, and so we're throwing them out of office, right? It was a, it was an anti-democratic vote uh, for some very personal and strong reasons that people had. Um, it's hard to grip as a, as a, as an operative. It's hard, sorry, it's hard to grip as a politician, but it's just the reality. The voters, you know, were fed up at that that point in time, and and COVID had a lot to do with it. Okay, and, and give us a couple of weeks. Once after the election, mm -hmm. what was Steve Sweeney or uh, Senator Sweeney? What was his thoughts? And so, I mean, the thoughts are, you know, I mean, there's a lot. I mean, because he wasn't just a senator; he was also the Senate president. Um, he had already had lined up the support to get reelected as Senate president. So, one of the first things we had to focus on is who's going to be the next Senate president. Right. How was that going to happen? How are we going to work with the the caucus to to make that happen? Um, so, I mean, it's just, and that's sort of a process thing, but a process thing you now have to focus on and worry about. Um, and so that's, that's it. Fortunately, largely what happened is, we, you know, we made a uh, very small, uh, changes in that front. Uh, Senator Scutari was now the Senate president was, uh, slated to be remain as the judiciary chairman. He got put in as uh, Senate president and we brought Senator Stack in as the judiciary chair, uh, and left the rest of the leadership intact. Uh, which I think was helpful, and most of the therefore the committee chairs and that that stayed intact. So nothing much changed, um, but a lot of conversations ha had to come into play in order for that to happen. Um, and then the other thing was, what do we do next? Um, and the you know the the thought process was, hey, you know we've had this great uh, run on policy, uh, a lot of influence, and we've done so much for Rowan University that there's probably a great synergy that we could do a program. A pragmatic policy institute, a little bit different than we think other policy institutes have been done, um, not only in New Jersey, but across the country. And so uh, we approached, uh, the center president approached uh, President Hushmand at the at Rowan University, and, and we started off with the uh, Sweeney Center for Public Policy. And, and what did they do there? What's, give us a little insight on what so, that entails. So, um, you know, the, the, the goal is to, uh, you know, move policy ultimately we're still in our early stages but we annually we're about to come out with again review the um the but we do revenue forecasting which doesn't really get done when you're doing the state budget 
So uh, revenue forecasting being like, what is the impact of decisions made today going to have in five years from now? What's the, what will the budget look like? And also do revenue projections. What will the economy be like? How much money will be coming in? Can we afford to continue to do the same thing we're doing five years from now? Um, then we also have recently, we, we did a wind conference on the offshore wind, something that Senator President Sweeney was very much involved in and did a report on all the impacts and the economic impacts that that will come along with wind being done offshore as well as the environmental impacts, right? The, the fact that it'll, you know, lower the carbon um, carbon emissions from uh, non-renewable or non-nuclear sources for energy. Um, and, you know, we continue to look at um, other types of policy issues. I'm sure we'll get into healthcare issues because it's always a major issue. Um, we're going to probably look at uh, artificial intelligence. So, we continue to work with uh, with the academics and and try to frame uh, that research in a way that will move policy and hopefully that legis- you know in a nonpartisan way right just a, a straight up academic point of view but with uh, you know with the look at how can we create laws or policies that will be put into place by government to address the issues that we've identified academically. All right, good deal. So here's a big question: Is Senator Sweeney running? for governor in so, 2025? That, that is a great question. Uh, I will tell you, I want Senator Sweeney, former Senator Sweeney, to run for governor in 2025. Um, th- those decisions are yet to be made. I think he would be an exceptional governor. As I said earlier in our segment, he was uh, he knows more about government than anybody. He, he could run uh, the state of New Jersey, I think, better than anybody. Uh, um, and knows, you know, knows how different independent agencies need to work, knows the people that need to fill the roles in those positions. He knows uh, that, you know, one of the big things we need to do is, you know, cut costs. And, he, and it's not cutting costs for the sakes of cutting programs, but to make them more efficient. We can run local government more efficient through shared services and uh, some smaller governments. We can run uh, as we did with our healthcare program, and we created what be, you know, with innovative ideas. We looked at the uh, pharmaceutical benefits plan, and Senator President Sweeney came up with an idea to do a reverse auction that saved uh, uh, the state billions of dollars over several years. So there, it doesn't mean we're providing any less pharmaceutical benefits to state employees, um, but we're doing it in a more efficient way. Uh, we've saved you know millions of dollars through uh, bail reform, which ultimately got people out of the, the prisons, and these are people on convicted individuals pre-trial. Um, and, you know, counties didn't have to operate as many prisons. So uh, it doesn't, it hasn't changed the justice system. It hasn't changed what, how people should be treated. It just lowered our cost and treated people humanely. So we get we can continue to do those things. I don't think anybody can do them better than uh, Senator President Sweeney. There's a lot of quality candidates out there. Um, but, you know, that's that's what we'd have to look for. And it's what this state needs, as we all know. Uh, and I love New Jersey. hope to never leave. But it's a high cost state. Um, we need to make it more affordable for everybody. Uh, but that doesn't mean we need to lower any of the quality of the services and government services we have. Uh, and that's not what he wants to do. And no, I don't think anybody has ever approached government uh, as effectively as Steve Sweeney has in, in those areas. He did it as a as a freeholder, he did it as a state senator, and and also nobody's had the influence on any position in legislature uh, as Senator President Sweeney did. So he's he's already shown what he can do, uh, but as governor, he could do more of it. So I hope he runs. Uh, you know, I'm encouraging him to do so, but I mean that's a decision between him and his family, and he'll make it at the right time. And are you willing to become chief of staff if, uh, for the campaign <laughs> if he asks you to? Uh, listen again, one step at a time. Okay. Um, give us a little insight on your thoughts on you know, gun policy in, uh, in um, New Jersey. I mean, I know they, they started saying, you know, you can uh, conceal carry. They gave permission on uh, conceal carry. What do, how do you feel about that in New so, Jersey? Yeah. So, well, first of all, New Jersey didn't give conceal carry. Right. Uh, the federal government gave conceal carry. Uh, I, you know, I think it's a complicated issue. I think we have really strong gun laws in the state of New Jersey. Um, which has uh, helped and made people safe. Now, you know, the it, individuals, there's still one gun a month laws, there's still a limited amount of people, so what they can carry, and it is a concealed carry, which largely means it's, it's going to be a smaller weapon than if it were to be um, open carry. 
right? You're not going to, um, but fortunately, we don't allow assault weapons either. They're not legal in the state of New York. Um, but the, you know, the, the the Second Amendment has been debated heavily, uh, obviously, on, on multiple sides. And, you know, it it is out there and it, it provides a, a right for individuals to, um, right, uh, keep and bear arms. Uh, and, you know, it's it, what's interesting, I don't know if you saw the, with that, with the news yesterday, though, that Governor Newsom out of California decided, hey, we should have a state's uh, initiative to um, uh, basically regulate guns, right? So it's the 28th Amendment that he's proposing. And it, I think it's, it's an interesting start because even amongst gun owners, people do believe there should be some regulation. Um, and as, as Governor Newsom pointed out, he's not looking to take away guns, I think, which would be very difficult uh, with the prevalence we have of guns throughout this country. Um, but regulating them can help, I, you know, with too many people dying in random occurrences and in classrooms and school graduations at, at malls, at movie theaters, at um, hospitals. So uh, you don't know where you can go uh, and this won't be an issue. And, and what we found is with many of these instances that the individuals who were um, the, uh, the perpetrators, you know, just got old enough or eligible to own a gun. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't mean that people shouldn't have a right, uh, to own a gun. And I'm a big believer in, uh, hunting and people should be able to hunt, uh, and own whatever, uh, weaponry they, they need to appropriately do it. I don't think you need to blow a deer to smithereens, but if you want a deer to hunt and you want to eat that deer, you should have a right to do so. But it, you know, if you want to be able to protect your, um, your household, you should be able to do that as well. Um, but that doesn't mean there should be no regulation. So fortunately, like I said, we've had, uh, goes back to Governor Florio, right? We've had great laws on the books here in the, in the state of New Jersey, which we're proud of. Can we do more in New Jersey? I think it's really hard um, to think we could, we can do more. But so in going back to the open carry thing, the, the, what the federal government ruled, which, you know, it's an interesting ruling, but, you know, it was a very special permit to be able to have a right to carry. So we already had one. Um, and so the, the problem was there wasn't much, uh, it was sort of arbitrary in, in some respects. And I think at least that's the way the court sees it, um, as who could get a permit to carry versus who could not have a permit to carry, um, which if you're going to have it, maybe that wasn't so fair. Um, so, you know, do we have to allow anybody to carry? I mean, uh, that isn't a police officer, Maybe not, or maybe we need to regulate it in, in a more systematic way. So I think that'll continue to be worked out. Um, but we've been fortunate since that's happened. It's only been a couple of months. We haven't had issues uh, with anybody who's, you know, had that right. But we certainly still have issues with people who have illegal guns or use them, sure. right? So um, that's the that's the problem, too, with how we have this. There is a big prevalence of guns throughout the country. And most crimes in New Jersey are committed with guns not bought in New Jersey, not, you know, legally owned uh, in New Jersey. So um, not sure that we, you know, we'll see what ha happened, but I'm not sure we need a lot more laws to change in New Jersey. Because again, I, I mean, we did almost two years ago, we did a gun package with Governor Murphy. So it's, it's we continue to have them, but we're sort of at a point where we're just around the edges now with gun, gun control policy in New Jersey. Now, does New Jersey have a stand your ground law or is that... We do not. You know, why, mm -hmm. why would, you know, if Florida has one, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I always contested with that because if somebody's coming into my house and mm -hmm. I had have the right to shoot and kill him, or if, even if he, if I feel threatened mm -hmm. or if he pulls out a gun and I have the right to take my gun out and shoot and kill him, you know, that well, you stand right your ground. You have self-defense. Self-defense. But, you know, stand your ground law is pretty much that, that that's what it is. Well, the, well, if we look at it, let's just look at Trayvon Martin. Okay. I, I, what do you stand? A, a kid is walking home with a Gatorade and a bag of Skittles. Right. He, uh, you know, there, there's an example of, uh, I think it was in Alabama, and it, uh, the case hasn't been heard yet, but 10 year old was playing hide and go seek, or, you know, or 14 year old, I forget how old, only a couple of weeks ago. And uh, hide and go seek happened to be, not be on her property. Uh, and somebody shot her, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we have, so yeah, should you be able to, again, should you be able to protect yourself? You should, but should you be able to shoot somebody and then claim that you're standing your ground like you felt intimidated? Uh, unfortunately, especially as, as we, we watch these things, I think if you're, uh, you know, if you're a minority community, especially if you're black, you're more likely to be convicted 
um, if you if you would sorry you're more likely to you know be felt feel threatened and if you're killed that the perpetrator will would get off as opposed to if you were white right if a white person dies that's unfortunate part of our justice system but that's where the statistics are so uh, unless there was a you know a clearer way of which those circumstances are um, we can't have the wild west where you can just you know claim you felt threatened and shoot people um, you know, and even if we look at, uh, uh, there was one recently, but, um, I'm trying to think with, with some of the names and I forget them, but you know, people, let's say you went shoplifting, you know, I mean, if I shoplifted and I got caught for shoplifting, the penalty is not death. Right. 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 So, right. And now if you're going to, you know, feel your, feel your life is threatened and mm -hmm. then absolutely. Um, and you see that a lot with how the police officers are, right? So, um, you know, the police officers and, and people complain about this, and, and we do a great job, I think, here of investigating these things in New Jersey. But most of the time when a police officer uses a gun, I'm not going to say it's all the time, but most of the time it's because they are threatened and they do feel threatened. Um, and, and as we know that, the, you know, the police officers then uh, are, you know, use their weapon o appropriately. It's, it's an unfortunate incident, but you know, those are the examples I would say, you know, and again, not, you know, not society is not perfect, but, um, uh, more of those instances are legitimate than in what you'll see in the standard round states and how people use weapons. And that's scary to me. Going back to the guns, yeah. we, you know, there's a, there's a huge issue that i feel that we have like when you're in pennsylvania you're a gun owner yep and you can't bring your gun over to new jersey even yeah. though you sometimes you cross the bridge you know and you accidentally put it in there mm -hmm. that's a felony yes you can get arrested if you're a pennsylvania gun holder mm -hmm. and you have the legal right to carry that concealed weapon and you cross the bridge by accident and the police catch that gun on you you get arrested and it's yep. a felony charge how can we change that yeah, so we actually tried, it, it would help with that. I mean, we even have, uh, I forget exactly what it's called, but a deviation. Thing. So let's say you're right on the on the Pennsylvania issue or any out-of-state person who legally has a right to own a gun and, and keep it with them. And, and it's close. It's Correct. not like it's, it's three states <laughs> so, down. Yeah, I mean, it, a lot of people live in New yeah. Jersey or Philly and even if you, and Yeah, even if you, but even if you were a hunter in New Jersey. So let's say I was hunting out here around Swedesboro um, and I decided I want to, you know, uh, get something to eat on my way home and I live up in Hamilton now in New Jersey well I may have that may be now illegal if I stop to eat because I've deviated from the route from me coming down here to go hunting which is right. what I was supposed to do um, and you know you can go to prison for that what I like many laws right and that is one of them is I mean maybe it should be a fine right like okay you right. shouldn't do it you made a mistake it should be a fine I mean we we, um, we definitely and it's an example I mean we over incarcerate uh, individuals on many levels, and and that is one of them. It it does not. It's not right on the deviated route. We tried to change that when I was w working with Senator President Sweeney um, uh, a couple of years. I mean, uh, who knows how many years ago? I don't want to say a couple, but it's, good. it's probably more than a couple. But right. you know, we even tried to change that. And you know, we we've been working on getting rid of mandatory minimums, uh, especially for nonviolent criminals, for a long time. And you know, that has its ups and downs and its complaints. But yeah, you know, if you were, you know, just, and again, I'm just pure policy. Um, listen, I don't want to make it legal personally. I mean, we should have the right to our laws. That does not mean somebody should be going to prison because they had a gun, right? As Unless the police can prove that there was an intent to sell, an intent to use, right? That a further intent, but just having possession of it, especially to your point in the circumstance you get, they're a legal gun owner and a legal right to, to use it. Um, I mean, that's just, it, it, it's an excessive penalty. Absolutely. But it's not the only example of excessive penalties in laws in New Jersey. Right, right. How do you feel about marijuana laws and legalizing marijuana in New Jersey? You know, several states, including Denver, have a huge homeless mm. population due to the legalization of marijuana. And you see that in many of the states that legalize marijuana. And uh, now some of the workplaces I go, they, they smell like marijuana. So they're on the job smoking weed because it's legal. I mean, yeah, what I do mean, we, there are not, expect, I, I can speak more in Jersey. There's no significant increase or I, I doubt any, but I don't know that. I, what I do know is no significant increase of homelessness because of the legalization of, mar legalization of marijuana. I think, um, you know, I can't speak to all the issues in Colorado. What I can think, what I can thank 
New Jersey boards, we weren't the first out of the gate. So when we were writing the legislation, we learned a lot from what other states had done. Um, and so I think, you know, I think we're doing it right. We're slowly rolling it out. I wish it was happening more quickly. Um, but I don't think it's increasing homelessness. Um, to your point, though, and I don't know where people are using it in the workplace. Um, I, I, I agree with legalization. I agree with recreational legalization. I agree with, you know, ultimately not trying to put people in prison for a marijuana offense. Uh, but, you know, just like I didn't like when people were smoking around me, it's, you know, a cigarette. This is smoking marijuana is sometimes worse. Uh, it's a bit of a putrid smell, uh, as we know. Uh, and I, hopefully those things will be rectified over time, right? You know, where people are smoking and how they do and uh, how they use it. But, I, you know, I think it's good. I think it's been rolled out well in New Jersey. We're not seeing problems. Um, you know, I, you'll hear different complaints for different reasons, and they'll blame the marijuana laws. Um, I think it's a red herring uh, where those things do happen. But that doesn't mean over time, as we learn uh, from how the law was implemented, and that we're not going to need to change it. Um, we were creating a whole new industry, a whole new operation, and um, you know, we're going to learn from the experience, just like we learned from other states' experiences when we wrote the law. We're going to learn from our own experience, and changes are going to need to be made. Um, but I don't, I, I think it's been a positive and not a detriment to the state for sure. Okay. And, um, also I think there's a law in New Jersey, right? Where a veteran who has PTSD, who smokes marijuana, cannot own a gun. I believe that. So, is, so there's a, it, so it, medical, if you have a medical card yeah, and you're a, I, I'm not an expert. I okay. know it's, it's related to federal law. Right. Um, and actually, gun, uh, police have the same issue uh, in, in uh, owning a gun as well and how they own it, um, which became an issue. I can tell you, I'm, I remember it coming up as an issue. I don't know enough about to okay. speak about it. So uh, I think what you're saying is, is it's sort of right, um, but it's it's related to federal law. Okay. All right. Um, let's talk about factories. Swedesboro has mm. just a ton of warehouses that they're building. And it just seems like a factory industry. I mean, mm -hmm. roads filled with trucks, traffic. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to stop this? Sure. <laughs> Don't buy from Amazon. <laughs> right. I mean, we, I just walked into your, uh, you know, as I was walking in here, next year, a neighbor had about six, seven packages right. um, delivered to their house. Right. Uh, that's, it's, it's how the economy has evolved, right? You're seeing closed storefronts, you're seeing smaller, you know, less malls. Uh, because people are getting deliveries to their house. Well, guess what? Those deliveries come through warehouses. And those warehouses are getting closer and closer uh, to where people live because the ultimate goal of the delivery services, whether it's Amazon or somebody else, is they want to deliver quickly, right? right. It's, it's now more about speed. Uh, and quanti the quicker they get, the less people are going to go to the store because if I can get any, I can even get groceries now. I don't have to go out to the store and something can be delivered to my house as quickly as I could have gone to the store to pick it up. Now I can do other things with my life. Um, so it, that's sort of the issue. Um, I, I don't think that that's going to change, right? It, it's, a, you know, governments aren't allowing it because, oh, it's just an easy way to get money. It's, there's a huge demand and the demand's coming from the people who live in the communities that it's around. Could we plan, uh, plan it better? Absolutely. And that's the bigger issue we have. Um, listen, in Swedesboro here, you sort of have a great opportunity because there's so much open space. Right. Um, but because there's so much open space, to your, the, the roads aren't necessarily built for those large trucks, right? So, you know, you have the, you do have space where maybe the traffic uh, is better, but then you still have small roads. So you have these big trucks on a one lane road next to small cars or school buses, which can become problematic. Um, and it's scary. So can we, we need to plan it out better. I don't know if we're going to do that. Senate President Sweeney. Uh, worked on a couple of bills, two bills that he worked on. Uh, one was, was one uh, that there would be a joint requirement for joint planning, especially if the uh, warehouse was going to be built near a border of two towns or even with two counties, um, and that there'd be more uh, coordinated planning that would go involved in that, uh, which would help. And the other one he did is that, you know, there's a you know, a lot of, as you're experiencing here in the Swedesboro area, the farmland being turned in. And part of that is, is you can use eminent domain um, because they're claiming that the farmland is, isn't the, the 
uh, I forget what the, there's a terminology for it in the eminent domain law, but basically that a warehouse is, is a better economic use than farming. That was not the intent of eminent domain. Eminent right. domain was one of these warehouses go empty, we should be able to develop it. But if it's a vacant area, if it's a brownfield, you know, where it's been contaminated, those are the types of things that we intended for eminent domain, not taking farmland and making it into a warehouse. And not to say that, and the thing is that that wouldn't have prevented that farmland from becoming a warehouse, but it, it over incentivizes that development and it gives them a better property tax rate, okay. um, which, you know, doesn't seem fair. I mean, the, these warehouses are being built there uh, because the land is cheap, regardless of what they're going to pay and their property taxes. And remember, if they're paying less in property taxes, you as the homeowners a year are then eating up, right, whatever, whatever they're not paying. So it, it doesn't change. So... Uh, there are things we can do to better plan. Absolutely. I don't know if it's going to happen because the, all of this stuff is happening so quickly, but these warehouses are being built because people are buying products that are coming through these warehouses. Right. Um, that, and that leads to my next question, taxes. Yeah. How do we reduce taxes in the state of Jersey? You got so many people moving mm -hmm. out to Florida. I mean, <laughs> in, in, in droves. Mm -hmm. Because of the high tax rates, house housing taxes. I mean, some mm -hmm. places thirteen thousand to twenty thousand dollars mm -hmm. a year just in taxes. Is there a way to reduce it, or is it just going to get higher? So, the I would never want to argue that taxes are going to get lower. And I think if politicians do, they're crazy. What you can do right. is certainly slow the growth, right? And that's what you need to work on. And so, you know, Senate President Sweeney did. You know, he was the one who led the effort for the two and a half percent property tax cap. That we, you know, it couldn't go, which has worked. Um, and he has said repeatedly and publicly, it probably should have been zero because, and zero again, wouldn't necessarily help us to destroy our services, but it would force the governments to look at shared services or create more efficiencies. And remember, the, uh, there's also the caveat that it, the two and a half percent, if the voters decide they need something beyond what the government can afford with the two and a half percent cap, it can go to the voters and the voters can approve. Um, so things cost a lot. If you want to have good schools, we're going to spend more money. The problem is, and, and we tried to get at this, you have uh, you have more school districts than towns. And we have 565 towns in the state of New Jersey, 600 and something school districts. So it's a lot of towns. It's a lot of government. It's a lot of overlap. There are different studies about the efficiencies and whether or not sharing services or consolidating services. You could argue that all day long. Um, the reality is, over the long run, there's a lot of opportunity to share those services uh, and create more efficiencies. If you want, you know, if we could just regionalize school districts, um, right? So you have K through five districts, you have K through eight districts, you have K through twelve districts. If we had all K through twelve districts, you could you would have then only K through twelve superintendents as opposed to a superintendent of a K through five or a K through eight or a K through six, depending on on where you live, um, and over time, those those, those costs add, add up uh, on those administrative efficiencies. I mean, when, you know, you just take the superintendent on down type of uh, officials, and that's not eliminating teachers. It's just your administrative level staff um, that you can start consolidating and coordinating. And so ultimately, as you do that, you can, you know, you're probably not going to cut costs, but you can certainly uh, reduce the increases. And then you have building efficiency. So, uh, you know, the example that I mentioned with the school funding formula earlier, the big problem here is, in the, this area was you, you were seeing large growth for the Kingsway Regional School District, but no more state aid because state aid was flat for everybody. Well, what was happening is you had other school districts who were declining um, in enrollment and getting their state aid. But along with that, you're then having buildings that aren't being used while Kingsway and other areas are going to need to build more, right, to accommodate the students. If you have a more regional structure, uh, which you do here in Kingsway, but or even a countywide structure, you might be able to better utilize those buildings and those empty buildings and those newer buildings in a way that create more efficiency. Um, so there are, you know, certainly things that you can do, but, uh, you know, uh, the argument about Florida, a couple of things. One is, People constantly are moving into New Jersey. Our largest group of, typically are immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, people moving to Florida, while they are happening, a lot of times it's seniors. And the reason why it's seniors is because people with children do not want to educate their children in Florida. Right. right? So at a, at a point in time in their life when it becomes better, but they're not moving to Florida with kids. And they don't want their grandkids to be going and to schools in Florida or Alabama or Mississippi. 
They want them going to school in, in New Jersey. So um, the quality of the services that we have here uh, are significantly better. But then even as seniors fall, find out, we, you know, we provide better for our seniors. A lot of seniors have a hard time finding food. We have better SNAP benefits. We have better SNAP programs. They have, you know, a hard time finding the the, the quality of health care. With what we, how we help subsidize our hospital systems and our doctor providers, you know, they find, hey, you know, when it gets to a certain point in my life, if I want better health care, Florida is not the place to get it. You right. know, in New Jersey or this area is, and those things are costly. So there's certainly people do move, but they find it, you know, the grass isn't always greener, but you have no income taxes, you know, down in Florida. So when you're a senior, that's nice to have. But um, again, there, you know, you're not worrying about some of the other services that you do rely on, uh, especially if you have a family that are, are quality to have here in the state of New Jersey. Um, so while we have good quality and that quality costs a lot, absolutely though, to your question, we can do more things to to reduce the increase of those costs, and we need to. Um, and we have to look at healthcare always continues to be a major component, and public employee healthcare, uh, and how we look at how those costs are going up because they're typically the largest cost driver, public employee healthcare driver of of what drives up our property taxes uh, to cover those costs. And you know there are multiple ways to approach that issue. And and again, the PBM was one example. Um, we did a patient center healthcare focus, which was a which was another example. Um, but you know, we uh, government should not give up on on those issues. And um, you know, anyway, I, I, that's where I would leave it off. I could probably go on, but yep. and, I, and I could sit here and talk for hours about all these issues. But we have a limited number of time, so yeah. I'm trying to get the most important questions. And talking about education, that is the biggest issue right now in mm-hmm. United States, mm-hmm. where you have people who parents who don't want their kids to learn about LGBTQ or, mm-hmm. or uh, trans or any of that. Mm-hmm. I mean, it feels like they're you know, arguing that New Jersey is introducing some of those topics to young children as mm-hmm. young as kindergartners. And you know, you, I've seen fights happen at <laughs> school events mm-hmm. um, between parents mm-hmm. because of these issues. Where do you stand on that? Where does New Jersey stand on that? So, yeah, we, we did introduce bills. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding uh, misinformation on on how that gets taught and and over what years that gets taught in, um, and so, but you know, we, we've seen it, it is right for people to understand that there are different types of people in the world, different from whomever they are, uh, and it's right to parents who want to have an interest. But a sing the way government is is set up and the way public services of which a public school is or set up is it's it's for the community and not for any single individual. And what you're getting with these parents who are complaining, it, it's more about their individual component and individual right. Um, but they're speaking in a way that they're trying to say, oh, you're infringing on me when they forget that for up until this point, we've really been infringing on those that individuals we're not talking about, putting people and hiding them uh, doesn't mean they don't exist. So, you know, you, you can't hide the fact that there were slave owners any more than you can hide the fact that somebody is gay or somebody is a lesbian or somebody is a transgender. Um, and really, it's it's not about, you know, um, exposing anybody to something they're really not exposed to. It's just waking them up and, and letting them know that's normal. Because if we don't let them know it's normal, that's when you get hate. Um, and you get hate uh, crimes, and not only that, then you also have the mental illness component with it. If I have to hide who I am from my friends, from my family, uh, from my school, that has a huge mental uh, taking, and we we already know we have a huge mental health crisis in this, and that it's only added uh, and exacerbated by individuals who feel they have to hide who they are. And and for a long time, and including what we're talking about, it's individuals who are, you know, lesbian or gay or transgender, and it is who they are. Um, and and what people, and if I, if I don't want to, if I go to a library and I don't want to read a book, I'm not going to read the book. The people who want to go in and ban these books and ban these things, because uh, a lot of times it's just, you know, the books are taken out. They've never read a book in their life. <laughs> right, I shouldn't say in their life, but they certainly haven't read those books, right? And they want to ban it. Uh, you know, ninety something percent of the kids probably aren't going to check out that book, right? And then what gets in- introduced into the curriculum, it's just like what gets introduced to any other thing. It's you know, it's um, it's 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 not that I'm learning about social equity in math. It just means that in the question in math, 
it may mention that the individual is gay or black or Hispanic, right? It, that's, you know, if it's a, if it's a uh, word question as a, you know, then that's it, you know, um, that's but, but how does you it, integrate it into the curriculum. But should, shouldn't the parents have the right to um, have, you know, to show what they're teaching in the public schools? Shouldn't the parents have the right to have an ability to choose what is learned? So, no, I mean, ultimately, no. I mean, that's not the way our school systems are set up, right? The school systems are, are set up that there's a curriculum development. Mm -hmm. um, that there are curriculum coordinators within the school districts. That's what they're hired to do. That's what their expertise are to do. Um, you know, they, they have a right to uh, elect the school board, and they have a right to elect a legislature, right, who may have uh, policy opinions. Um, but to get to the individual curriculum, there's a whole process set in place of experts who do that, that, you know, from whoever the, the superintendent is on down. And um, then the school board gets to choose who that superintendent is. And, and there are, but then there's laws that have to be followed. And we live in a representative democracy. So it, it, it's those that represent the, the legislators, the school board members, uh, that make certain decisions. And then it's the, the public servants we put in place that also make those decisions. But we're talking about something that isn't about what their child is to learn. We're, we're talking about whether or not we can continue to, we have to hide people or hate against people. Um, you know, gay people live in our society. Whether or not your student learns about them in a book or not doesn't change that. But by excluding somebody from a book, you're, that's a huge problem. Um, so if we're sitting there and saying, hey, you know, I, you know, if we if we if we were also talking about, and, you know, hey, we're not going to allow any black people in those books. I, the communities would act a lot different, but there's no difference. Right. We're talking about, you know, who somebody is, um, and, you know, that that should not have an impact on anybody else. That's just who they are. Um, it, it doesn't mean I'm saying you should be gay. Uh, or you should be transgender, or you should be... No, it's just we individuals exist in our society, and we just need to recognize that. And the more we recognize it, the more people are comfortable with individuals around them, no matter how different from themselves that they are. So in that case, then should prayer be back, brought back into school? Because there are Christians who believe in Christianity, but prayer was banned. That's, well, there's a Supreme Court case that, that could change some of that, and, and it has changed some of that. But again, you know, you're so you can learn that Christianity exists. You can learn that Islam exists. You can learn that um, your Jewish religion exists. Learning about the religion and individuals who practice it is different than then having people actually uh, participate in that religion. Just like it, it, we're saying, like, hey, it's not like, hey, you. you you have to be gay. You have to be Christian. No, but the fact is Christians exist. Islam exists. Satan ex exists, right? Individuals exist. There's nothing, you know, that we shouldn't, we should understand and appreciate that that exists. But then to have, um, you know, prayer be led in school by a uh, teacher uh, is wrong. Now, if a student chose for whatever reason they wanted to pray or they felt at a time they needed to pray they should that shouldn't be stopped and if even if a teacher wanted to pray um sorry fix this headset even if a teacher wanted to pray they shouldn't be stopped that's different than leading students in prayer um and you know so I, no i don't think it should be brought back in but it, uh, it should be allowed to happen if an individual feels right i mean uh, me praying shouldn't have an impact on, on how you now if for some reason I'm shouting my prayer and it starts or my prayer has words that it shouldn't have but if I want to you know take my time to practice my religion you know I should be able to do that but the public school should not lead lead in that effort okay um you know we got a limited time left I want to talk about Ed Durr. what do you how do you feel about Ed Durr? Um, I don't know Ed Durr. Your, okay <laughs> 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 All right. I mean, and he's running for a Republican. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he's been elected for the Republican uh, mm -hmm. candidate. Who do you have for the Democrats? Is it we have John Bersatelli, the former assemblyman, former mayor of Paulsboro, okay, um, former you know district mate of uh, Steve Sweeney, uh, one of the most thoughtful, intelligent legislators that I've ever uh, gotten to deal with. Um, I think he's going to be a, a great candidate. Um, you know, again, I, I I can't speak to Senator Durr. Uh, and or who he is, but uh, I mean, I know about him. I've read about him, but I don't know him personally, so I, I don't want to say too much about him. What I can tell you is that uh, the third district 
couldn't be represented by a better person if it's not Steve Sweeney than John Persichelli. Okay. And how do you feel about dirty politics? Because I talked to a lot of senator candidates who said that they start digging into your past. Mm -hmm. They, you know, politics can get really dirty and personal. Tell us your experience on that. So it can. Um, And um, the first question I ever ask candidate as I'm recruiting them is, is there anything in your past that you're not going to want to come out? Uh, Because if it exists, it's coming out. Um, And so it's just something they have to think about. Uh, Arguably, you know, people are like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't like dirty politics. I've been involved in reading polls 25 years. Uh, If I ask a question, uh, you know, hey, you know, would you support this candidate because they're going to cut your property taxes? Yes, I would support them. Of course, most of the electorate wouldn't believe that even if it were true. Um, but they would support it. Let's say it's, you know, hits 60%. Oh, well, would you not support somebody if you knew, uh, you know, uh, they were illegally getting benefits from the government? That's like 90%, right? So, you know, it, the negative messaging, it just has a much greater impact on the voters' decisions. And they, you know, routinely say that in the polling. So as much as people will individually, oh, I hate this dirty politics, it influences their decision. And as you look at the, at the polling, uh, that's what happens. And, you know, fair on fair, it's unfortunate. It's just, it's what moves voters uh, is, is negative uh, campaigns. And it's, you know, it, it, until the voters decide that it's going to be what somebody's for versus what it, somebody's against, um, we're going to have negative campaigns. So I don't think anybody likes it because no, uh, listen, I mean, uh, I don't know many people who like to say bad things about people. Uh, anybody, right? You don't run into them. Politicians in that level are no different. They would much rather be talking about what they want to do and what they want to accomplish. And if it were up, and most candidates that I've ever met, if it were up to them, that's what they would do. They would talk about that. It's people like me who are more behind the scenes and the consultants are saying, all well and good, but you're not going to win, right? right. You're going to win because you're, you know, we have this piece of salacious, uh, you know, information on our opponent and that's going to have an impact. And it's just, that's, it's unfortunate, right? I mean, I, I wish it wasn't that way, but it is. And that's why we do what we do. All right. So we got five minutes left and I want to talk to you about what advice would you give young people who want to run for politics or Mm -hmm. run for uh, government offices? Where should they start? What's the first office that they should start running (laughs) to get started? So, uh, you know, running for, you could run for any office. I don't think there's one to start with. Um, I think they're all, and I've said this to people, all, and I've worked on campaigns. I have never worked on a true presidential campaign, but I've worked everything from a school board race up to a gubernatorial race. And what I can tell you is they're all the same, right? Okay. It's just the scale, right, that, that ultimately changes. Uh, and you start small, right? Everything starts with the individual voter. And as a person who really is involved with it, right? So knocking, the first thing you always got to do and the strongest thing you got to do is is knock on doors. Um, And at a local level, you're probably doing it as as yourself as a candidate. As you get through the gubernatorial, you're probably, you know, getting volunteers or hiring uh, a a company to do it and help do it for you or recruit those canvassers to get your message out. And then you're doing mail that goes up to, you know, obviously TV. Uh, and you can do polling research. A lot of, if you're, you know, do opposition research, you can do polling, you can hold focus groups. So you're going to learn that at all different elements. It's a matter of where you want you, where you want to have an impact. Um, but it's also, I think if, if you want to run, it's understanding people always say, oh, you know, politicians are always lying. Well, I quite honestly, I've met very few politicians who lie, but the public expects something from their, uh, from their elected officials that is many times unreasonable, right? So obviously I'm gonna campaign, I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z. Well, a couple of things, right? Well, just me individually doesn't usually make a decision or almost any level of governments, right? You have council members, you have school board members, you have state legislators, uh, you have congressional members. So you it takes a compromise to get anything done, um, even if you're all of the same party, because you're still gonna have individual perspectives to get something done. Um, and so I think that's the, the piece that people need to understand, right? It's, it's I'm going to go into this, but I need to go into this that I need to fight as hard as I can for what I want, but I'm not going to get everything I want. I need to be able to get as much as I want um, and influence that or I'm getting nothing, right? You could, you could fight all the way 
forever until you want, if you want to get nothing done. Um, and so it's, it's the fact that if you want to go into this, you got to understand, you know, one, and we just hit it on there, you're going to get hit negatively. So you got to have some thick skin. Right. Um, and then number two, if you really want to get something done, you got to work with other people and you got to compromise. And sometimes it's working across the partisan aisle. Sometimes it's, you know, working with, you know, an urban representative versus a rural representative, depending on where you are um, and, and all different issues. And I've seen people from very, you know, uh, different spectrums come together to get things done. Um, but we could, you know, we can look at Washington and fortunately the, the debt ceiling uh, came through, but there's a lot of stuff in Washington that doesn't get done because uh, the, indiv- the different parties think I, any victory is a bad victory. Oh, the battery probably just ran out. That's okay. We're almost done. Perfect timing. We'll just do the last bit. We're good? Then we'll get off. Uh, I think it was about like a, I counted about uh, 20 seconds. Oh, that's good. Yeah, we're done. We're going to wrap it up real quick. Okay. How many people are you? What's that? How many people are you? Uh, you know what? So I, I put these short clips on TikTok. Oh, okay, uh, cool. They, I, my highest video was 350,000. Wow. Yeah, so nice. I got I got like 29,000 views. Does that get you in the pay category? for? Not yet. Okay. It's got to be right. in the well, higher. So what I do is I'll, I'll cut these clips into sections and put it on TikTok. All right, I'm going to follow you on YouTube. I don't have TikTok. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Um, Is it recording? It should be. Now it's recording. All right, good. Better? Okay. All right, Kevin, so we are going to wrap it up. Any last words that you want to uh, say or any advice that you want to give to young people? Well, first, thanks for having me. It's great to be down here, yeah, great in, the to have thir- here. in the third legislative district again. I haven't been down in a while, so really appreciate that. Uh, and just listen, everybody should be involved in government and politics. It affects everything in your life. Uh, being apathetic is is the worst thing uh, I think you can do because it gives uh, the elected officials uh, more power. And a lot of times, if you're apathetic around individuals uh, who are even you know, supportive view, but you don't want to have influence because you don't like what they're doing and you're apathetic, uh, it makes them even even more powerful. So the more you can engage in, in public service, uh, in a public voice and in voting, uh, the better we're going to make society. Uh, one, la- one last piece is, um, and it's along the side, we got to do so. And I would just a oh, point of personal preference and this is an example of it we need more journalism we need more coverage we need more people looking over government to 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 both say the right things about it but also keep them in check um the the smaller journalism has gotten uh the less reporters we have i think the again the less accountable our elected officials are uh and it'd be great to see more accountability and uh newspapers and journalism are an extremely important part Although a dying part of the of the democratic system, and yes. we got to do something to bring them back. And it's great that even we're doing something like this because this we need more of this. 